folksy friend. Thanks for joining me today as I talk about Tolkien lore. If you're interested in other stories, particularly fairy tales and mythologies, feel free to check out my other channel, Folksy Tales. So today we are going to talk about the aftermath of the death of Feanor. Feel free to check out my full video on how exactly Feanor died, but to cut a long story short, Captain has joined us. He was essentially coming out on top in a fight against Morgoth's forces, but he was so de determined, just like Captain is right now, to get my attention. Okay, come on. Hello. All right. But he was filled with such vengeance, such grief and anger at the death of his father that he essentially let his arrogance get the better of him. He went out ahead of his forces and ultimately was caught off guard and without enough support, and that is what led to his death. After his death, his eldest son was taken captive and hung by the wrist atop the highest peak of Thangorodrim. At the point that we're going to begin at, the remaining six sons of Feanor are at their camp along the northern shore of the lake Mithrim. At this time, the rest of the Noldor enter Middle-earth. And by the rest of the Noldor, I mean the families of Feanor's half-brothers. These half-brothers whom he left behind, essentially, betrayed on the crossing from Amon to Middle-earth. One of these half-brothers, Finarfin, actually is no longer with this group. He went back to Valinor, but his children are still with this group that has come over. Because Feanor betrayed them and stole the ships that were to be used to ferry everyone across, from Amon to Middle-earth, the only recourse they had, other than turning back, was to go across the grinding ice. And crossing the Helcaraxe cost many lives and caused those who undertook the journey great, great suffering. Suffice it to say, when Fingolfin and the rest of the family arrive in Middle-earth, they are less trying to find Morgoth than they are to find Feanor and have a little chat about his actions. Fingolfin and the majority of the Noldor who were with him step foot out of the Hilkaraxe upon the rising of the first moon. By the time they actually get into Hithlum, which is the highlands in which the lake is located, now we have the rising of the first sun. Tolkien tells us that this is the official end to the Age of the Stars. So with the sunrise, as I mentioned, Morgoth is pretty horrified at this light and his armies retreat. So Fingolfin and his group is basically able to roll straight up to the gates of Angband without much resistance. They get to these gates and they blow their trumpets so loudly that the fortress shakes. And Medros, being atop Thangordrim, hears this trumpeting and screams for help, but his screams are just lost in the din of noise and they're not heard. Now, Fingolfin is not as rash as Feanor. He has seen the power, the not only strength of Engband itself as a fortress, but the power of those that serve Morgoth. And he knows that he needs to be in a strengthened position if they are ever to defeat him. So instead of camping out at the gates, he decides to take his people and retreat back to the lake of Mithrim and essentially confront the Noldor that are there. The Noldor along the lake are so amazed and slightly shocked to see that Fingolfin and his group have survived the Helcaraxe that they immediately retreat. They move their camp to the southern part of the lake and let Fingolfin and his group set up camp on the northern part. Many of the Noldor that are now among the sons of Feanor actually regret what happened between these two groups. They regret the burning of the ships, leaving Fingolfin and that group behind, and they do want to make peace, but they're also very ashamed that they took part in it, and any desire that they had to rekindle their friendships and relationships is overcome, essentially, by the guilt of what they did. This, of course, delighted Morgoth to no end. He wasted no time in taking advantage of the division among his enemies. Very soon he was sending up smoke and vapors and poisons from Angband, which soon began to seep into the waters in the area around Mithrim. 
you really want to be involved in this, huh? And before long, all the elves that were around Hithlim could feel and hear the forges of Angband beneath the ground. Now, Fingon, who was the eldest son of Fingolfin, wanted to reconcile things between the two groups of Noldor. He saw, as likely others did as well, that the division between these groups is only going to hurt them. Plus, he had once been very close friends with Medros when they lived in Valinor, and he wanted to seek out his friend. Even though he thought that Medros had betrayed him and had taken part in the ship burning that left him behind, which wasn't actually true, Medros was not on board with the ship burning. <laughs> on board. He still wanted to go and find Medros and try to reconcile things between their families. So he actually used the very darkness that Morgoth had created for his benefit and snuck into the areas around Angband. He quickly saw that there was just no way that he was going to get in. And so, to spite the orcs, the enemies that had taken his friend, and really as a bit of a lament to Medros, he took out his harp and began to sing a song that had been written back in Valinor before there was times of strife within the house of Finwë. Suddenly, far, far above him, he could hear, way up in the mountains, Medros, who despite his extreme pain, was returning this song. Fingon managed to climb up a pretty big part of the mountain. He was trying to find some way to get to where Medros was and get him down. But there came a point where he just could not climb any further. He could see Medros, but he could not get to him. In his anguish and his desperation and his absolute hopelessness that he could ever be free, Medros begged Fingon to kill him. And Fingon, seeing his friend in such pain, wept. And Fingon strung an arrow and bent his bow. And seeing no better hope, he cried to Manwe, saying, O king to whom all birds are dear, speed now this feathered shaft and recall some pity for the Noldor in their need. Now, the Valar had very clearly said to the Noldor when they left Amon that no hope would ever come for them. Their cries, no matter how desperate, would never be heard. And I discussed this in the hiding of Valinor, that for the most part, they really did turn their back. But there were still a few things that were done to help the Noldor, because in his heart of hearts, Manwë did still care for them. One of the things he did was command the great race of eagles to leave the mountains of Amon and to take up residence in the crags of the northern mountains of Middle-earth. From their position, they were able to bring Manwë some news of what was going on in the early days of the Noldor. So as Fingon cried out his prayer, the eagles heard him. And suddenly, up from the sky came flying down to him, Throndor, king of eagles, mightiest of all birds that have ever been, whose outstretched wings spanned thirty fathoms. And staying Fingon's hand, he took him up and bore him to the face of the rock where Medros hung. Now that he was actually able to see his friend face to face, Fingon did anything he could think of to get the cuff off, but it was impossible. And again, Medros begged for death. Fingon was not about to leave him there or kill him when there was another option. He severed Medros's hand at the wrist, then took his friend down upon the eagle's back to the camp at Mithrim for healing. And although the physical injury and pain healed, and Medros was able to fight even mightier with his left hand, he still always bore the feeling, the memory of that pain with him for the rest of his life. Because of Fingon's actions, which were just so brave and selfless, things got better between the family members. In time, Medros went to Fingolfin himself, and he renounced his claim upon the throne, which, as the eldest son of the eldest son of the first king, was his birthright, but he renounced it and told Fingolfin, If there lay no grievance between us, lord, still the kingship would rightly come to you, the eldest here of the house of Finwë, and not the least wise. 
And so Fingolfin became the High King of the Noldor, which many of them were very happy about, not only because pretty much nobody liked Feanor at this moment, except his sons, but the majority of the Noldor had always favored Fingolfin becoming king after Finwë, so this was a good thing for them. Now united, the Noldor set up watches around Dor Dedaloth, and Fingolfin sent out messengers to communicate with the elves that still lived in Middle-earth. To the south, within the realm of Doriath, King Fingol was not too pleased that all these Noldoran princes had suddenly just shown up at his doorstep. Among the realms of Beleriand, the elves that lived there already knew about the Noldor and their return. The elves that lived around Mithrim, up in those highlands, had already sent word of the Noldor's arrival. And in fact, they were very happy at first, thinking the Noldor had shown up just around the time of the orcs to help them, to save the elves of Middle-earth from Morgoth and his forces. They had no idea the Noldor were technically there in exile. They had been banished from the realm of Amon for choosing to follow Feanor after the kinslaying that had taken place in Valinor. Worse still, the king of the elves in the west of Middle-earth, King Thingol, was initially the king of the very elves whom Feanor had killed. The kingdom of Thingol was protected by magical enchantments, essentially a border around his forests that were called the Girdle of Melian, Melian being his lovely wife, she is a Maiar, and these enchantments did not allow anyone within his realm that he did not permit. And so he decided that the only elves that he would permit were those of the house of Finarfin. This was because Finarfin, who is Fingolfin's brother, was married to Irwen, the niece of Thingol himself. So the children of Finarfin were his nieces, well, grand nieces and nephews. So he allowed Engnor, son of Finarfin, to enter Doriath and to speak with him. Engnor had come to Doriath on behalf of his elder brother, Finrod, who essentially is head of that line of the family now because Finarfin stayed behind. He told Thingol about the fight between Morgoth's forces and the Noldor and how the Noldor had been successful and explained the power structure and the kind of dynamics and the forces that the Noldor had up in Hithlum. However, he did keep secret the kinslaying. Despite the fact that Finarfin's family had tried to stop the kinslaying, at this point, Angnor and really that whole side of the family were at peace now with Feanor's sons, and so he did not want to cause any problems between Thingol and the rest of the Noldor. Upon hearing about the Battle of Dagar Nuingiliath, the battle under stars in the north, Thingol told Angnor to relay a message to all of his family up by the Lake Mithrim. His message essentially was that the Noldor could live where they were right now, up in Hithlum. They could also live in Dorthonian or any of the lands east of Beleriand. But Thingol was king of Beleriand and all those who lived there, and he needed the Noldor to understand that. He did not want these Noldoran princes and their people to think that they could just start displacing elves wherever they wanted. They had to stick to areas that were not ruled by Thingol. Then he said, Beware, therefore, how you princes of the West bear yourselves, for I am the Lord of Beleriand, and all who seek to dwell there shall hear my word. Into Doriath none shall come to abide, but only such as I call guests, or who seek me in great need. Essentially, if you come into my kingdom without my permission, you would better need help or there are going to be problems. A council was called for all the lords of the Noldor, so the great big family, and Angnor relayed the message. The sons of Feanor were not happy at Thingol's words. They were insulted, frankly, but Medros calmed them down, saying essentially that Thingol was king for a reason, 
and that his lands were his lands to rule as he saw fit, that the Noldor could just stick to the places that Thingol did not rule, as Thingol wanted, and that essentially Thingol should be pretty grateful that his new neighbors were going to be the Noldor instead of the orcs. But Karanthir was not happy about that. One day I will do a whole video on Karanthir and his spicy self, but he is very much like Feanor in that he struggles to keep his emotions in check. And he snapped at Engnor, let not the sons of Finarfin run hither and thither with their tails to this dark elf in his caves. Who made them our spokesmen to deal with him? Then brought up the fact that even though their father, Finarfin, might be Noldor and half-brother to Feanor himself, but their mother was of other kin, and that no one should forget that. As I mentioned, their mother is the niece of King Thingol himself. The entire reason Thingol even agreed to listen to a messenger of the Noldor. But clearly, Karanthir is saying this to other and insult his cousins, while kind of implying that they may not be trustworthy, which is highly ironic given the fact that he was one of the first on board to betray them in the first place and leave them back in Amman. And to explain the Dark Elf comment, the Noldor are among the Calaquendi, the Elves of Light, who went to see the trees who lived in Valinor at the beginning. The Sindar, the Elves that are currently in the western part of Middle-earth, are known as the Moriquendi, Elves of Darkness. But as Karanthir undoubtedly knows, Thingol himself is of the Kalaquendi. He was one of the first three elves to even go to Valinor with Karanthir's grandfather, Finwë. There's no way Karanthir does not know this, but his anger is getting the better of him here. He is lumping Thingol in with these dark elves with the implication that they are lesser, probably in all ways in his mind. It is clearly meant to be an insult that by default makes him and his group of the Noldor better than the Elves of Middle-earth. As expected, the children of Finarfin are offended and Engnor storms off. Medros does kind of chew out Karanthir, he scolds him for this outburst, but the damage is done. Many of the Noldor see this exchange and become concerned that the sons of Feanor are a little too much like their father. At this point, all Medros can do after getting mad at Karanthir is just to wrangle his brothers up and to leave the camp at Mithrim. Essentially, they are going to go out, find territories to settle in, and live apart from the rest of the Noldor. And that is what we're going to get into next week. Which lands the Noldor take over around the kingdom of Thingol, where everybody kind of sets up their home, and how that is going to affect the battles to come. I hope you'll join me for that next week when we go over that geography, those locations, and some of the early things that happen among the returning Noldor. But I also hope you will join me on Thursday where I will be releasing a video on the timeline of the years of the trees, just as a little happy May the 4th. I hope you enjoyed spending some time with me here today. Please consider liking, please consider subscribing. I really appreciate those of you who have subscribed. Please let me know what you think. I know I'm late to get to comments. I really, really appreciate them. I really do. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you soon.